Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm really glad to be here today, and I've been anticipating this event for quite some time now, and this is the good news. The bad news, however, is that uh, it's my first talk, so if it's not that great, I don't think you can get your money back. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll, 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 I'll do my best. So we're going to be talking about high performance today. And um, I'm going to take you through a few topics that we are going to go into detail in that are often considered when we are engineering for performance. And we're not going to cover everything because uh, this deserves a whole probably sequence of books, like the Game of Thrones, in order to cover all aspects of performance. So it's, uh, we're just going to look at a few things that have came up uh, frequently when I was dealing with such problems, and I'm going to show you ways how we can, um, how we can, what we can do about uh, positively impacting the performance of our Scala systems. So we're going to also conclude with uh, real life use case, because I'm sure you don't really want to just look at benchmarks and test code, that uh, takes these ideas and the theories behind what I will be talking about today and applies them in order to extract a bit more performance out of a real uh, component that's in production. So let's just get started. So the first thing is excessive object instantiation. And this is something that's fairly, uh, a fairly hot topic when it comes to performance. It's uh, important to keep in mind that actual object instantiation on the JVM itself costs time. Uh, it creates a lot more work for the garbage collector, and it can introduce systemic pauses in your application, which introduces non-determinism. And non-determinism is bad when we're talking about performance, because we don't only want to have something that runs fast sometimes, we want to have a system that's measurable and that's predictable and that we can put hard constraints on in terms of its latency and throughput requirements. So that being said, um, it's important to know that this is such an important topic that a fair amount of systems actually go through the effort of implementing GC-free data structures on, on off heap and uh, there are some commercial solutions that uh, try to achieve uh, zero pause garbage collection, uh, such as the Azul Zinc. And as a matter of fact, there was even a proposal on the JVM to introduce a no-op garbage collector that will just uh, do completely nothing. And it, didn't, it still isn't in, but it's something that, as a matter of fact, could be quite useful in certain class of systems that are running out there. So that being said, uh, let's illustrate the impact of object allocation on hold paths uh, with a real example. And it's the all loft extractor objects, right? So extractors, you all know this, they are pretty much um, an object with an unapply method which takes an object and tries to, gi tries to give back its components. And they're really useful in pattern matching and partial functions and a, overall a great tool for achieving brevity and expressiveness in your code. So <clears throat> what, uh, can we, what can we show, what can we actually do with extractors, right? Well, imagine this simple example where um, we have, a, we have a case class that looks like this. So it's a rook. I don't actually play chess, but I just found out that it's, it's, it's a cool example. We have a rook that is uh, either black or white, and we simply need to go to a board, to a square board full of rooks, and match on all black rooks and do something with their x and y coordinates. So pretty much extract them and uh, just uh, sum them up or whatever. So an extractor object that can do that and give us back uh, give us back the coordinates, looks a bit like this, right? We have the uh, checks whether the rook is black, and it gives back a tuple of the x and y coordinates, otherwise it, it, it's a none, right? So, but the interesting thing about this piece of code is that if you use Java P or any kind of bytecode viewing tool and take a look at the bytecode, it's going to look like this. 
And if you drill a bit further down, you're going to notice that apart from instantiating the specialized tuple of RET2, you're also creating a sum object, which, which is again allocated on the heap and uh, introduces a point of indirection and also creates work for the GC and uh, for all things involved around allocation and bookkeeping. So can we do better than that in this particular case? Turns out, yes, we can use uh, something that was introduced in 2.11, namely name-based extra extractors, to eliminate the need of using an option. So really, the requirement that these extractor objects, the name-based extractor objects have, is only to return an instance of a type that uh, defines two methods, the is empty and the get. And if we, have to, if we want to rewrite our extractor to utilize that functionality and make use of that feature, we can, um, we can write something like this, right? So it's, it's instead of returning an option, we are returning an extractor object that, uh, that defines these two methods and can get uh, and uses the fact that it takes an NRF, it uses it um, to have a guardian value that is null in order to determine whether the extraction is empty or not. So looking at the bytecode of this particular thing, you quickly notice that, again, the only allocation that happens and is, in this case, the instantiation of the tuple, of the specialized tuple of RT2. And, but does that even cause a dent in, in our performance? Does, it, does this matter? It turns out, yes, it actually matters significantly. Um, I have used uh, SBT GMH to run some benchmarks on different uh, sizes of chess boards full of black rooks and pretty much trying to, uh, going through the full rook, uh, through the full board, extracting every rook that is black and summing up their coordinates. And um, looking at the average time in milliseconds to perform this operation across various, uh, various sizes of boards, uh, it, it quickly becomes obvious that uh, this simple change uh, increases the performance quite some. And that's all pretty obvious from, from the results. And if you want to even go a bit further and analyze these kind of things, you can use a lot more tools that are there on the on, on part of the, part of the uh, tool chain to, to, to do so. So you can, you, you can print your GC application stop time and concurrent time to look at your pauses and look at their duration. Of course, you have to keep in mind that these pauses are not only introduced by garbage collection activity, but also other things as well, such as uh, bias lock reclamation, if there is uh, that happening. But nevertheless, there are tools that can show you a lot about what is happening with respect to this kind of allocation and reclamation activity that's going on with the JVM. And um, just uh, to show a quick, uh, a quick snapshot of what things sort of look like on the heap, uh, we can use Java P to take a look at the heap histogram and see that for the default implementation with the option, we are indeed have at this point in time when uh, the snapshot was taken, we have significant um, quantity of some objects allocated, while um, on the on the name-based version of the code, there is there is there is only tuples and rooks and integers and all the other stuff that that's that's on the heap at the moment. But there is no sign of sums allocated naturally. So that being said, um, again, it's important to consider these things, especially when you are running on a very hot hot code path, because um, the JVM is great. Uh, tool for managing, it, it gives you quite a lot of around the security of managing memory and, and, and there is a lot of work being done in, in, in that, but, uh, but it's not for free. So when you're, when you're engineering for performance, it's important to um, keep these things to a minimum. And not only that, but make sure you 
do that at the correct spot and, uh, of your code and of your systems. And this comes with measurements, setting up experiments, and looking at uh, the results of that in order to make informed decisions and put the effort where it needs to be. So that's one thing, uh, object instantiation and the excess of object instantiation is a pretty, pretty close to my thing that, that comes when, when, when thinking about performance on the JVM and Scala. But it's not only that, there are other things that we need to consider. And we need to keep in mind that all memory is not equal. This is something that probably that's quite important to uh, mention when somebody tells you that uh, an access into an array is always constant cost. It's, it's really not, right? It really depends what part of the array you're accessing. <laughs> so uh, that being said, uh, why am I even talking about this? Well, it has to do with um, memory access patterns and algorithms for doing that. And uh, this all comes down to our hardware. Uh, our CPUs nowadays are doing quite a lot more work apart from just uh, dealing with a bunch of arithmetic operations. And you probably all know that uh, one of their main jobs is masking latency to main memory, which is high. And the way they are doing that is through a hierarchy of caches that ensure our CPU's progress is not severely hindered by um, just constantly fetching data from main memory. And it is said that a cache miss is one of the most prominent performance killers on modern hardware. And this is true across all sorts of problem, uh, platforms, not just the JVM. So, of course, it, it, this is, this is, the hardware engineers have thought about that and have uh, provided us with a hierarchy of caches. And you all know about the L1 cache and L2 and L3 caches and, and what their respective latencies are and the sizes. But if you have to draw this, it would sort of look a bit like this, right? This is uh, sort of an imaginary memory hierarchy or at least how it sort of looks on my machine. Um, so we have the L1 cache, which is core local, the L2 and L3, which is shared and it sort of provides the main um, fabric that ensures that your cache subsystem is kept coherent. Um, and as you go left to right, you're increasing in size, but you're also increasing in terms of latency and data access costs. And then you go to main memory and things get quite ugly very quickly. Um, that being said, um, it's uh, probably useful to substitute that with an example, right? So something that you probably all love and it's gonna take you back to your high school uh, algebra years. It's uh, the matrix transposition problem, right? It's very simple. Let's say we have a square matrix of that nature and um, transposed, it would look like this, right? And imagine this matrix is stored in memory as um, in a column major order. And we can't, we can't really change that, right? So an algorithm, probably not the most efficient one, to transpose this matrix by doing accesses in a row major uh, order, so going left to, left to right, row by row, would sort of look like this, two nested for loops, so, so yeah, I'm guilty of that. But um, that would, that would sort of what it looks like in its simplicity, right? Um, so now imagine this, we run this piece of code on this kind of imaginary computer, which is not far away from what we have in these puppies here. Um, and imagine this machine sort of looks like one that has just cache and main memory. And latency to main memory is quite expensive, while access to cache are very quick. You can pretty much consider them free. Um, and imagine we load data in cache lines, which is as we do in our modern hardware. And these cache lines are four elements wide, four matrix elements wide, so four longs. They can only fit four longs, and you have a cache size of uh, just one line, one cache line. So you can store only four elements of the matrix in your cache. So if we run that kind of uh, algorithm um, and represent what visually is going to happen, 
it would look a bit like this, right? We have a contiguous array in memory storing the matrix in column major order. And um, we are accessing rows left, right. And the different colors represent the different cache lines, by, by the way, if, uh, if that's not clear. And if we proceed to transpose this matrix uh, running this algorithm, we quickly see that by the time we've, we're done with the first row, we've pretty much uh, accessed four separate cache lines. And so we have incurred quite a lot of evictions on our tiny, tiny one line sized cache. And naturally, we, we've, we've, we've resorted to, to main memory in that imaginary scenario. And this is, this is not great, obviously, because pretty much if you look at it, we are accessing and getting a full cache line in our caches, but we are sort of just operating and doing actual work on one fourth of it. So, so why do we even do that? Uh, we are throwing most of our data away that we are going to be using later on when we are, for example, accessing the second row. So what can be done about this? Well, you can sort of separate your matrix into um, recursively into smaller and smaller regions and uh, proceed as follows. So in that case, pretty much your first, uh, your first, the first uh, part of the matrix you're, you're going to be transposing, it's, uh, you're only going to be accessing two, um, two separate cache lines in order to to transpose one fourth of the matrix. So simply by changing our access pattern, we have effectively um, sliced our cache misses by a factor of two. And uh, does, it, th does this actually uh, have any dent on performance? Yeah, it, it, it certainly does. So looking at, the again, the JMH benchmarks, you can see that uh, for different sizes of matrix, and that's just a size of the matrix in one direction. So it's, for example, it's a square matrix of uh, 2084 by 2084. Uh, we can see that the cache-friendly approach achieves quite a lot of performance increase compared to the naive access pattern. And uh, this, this comes pretty close to mind. But if we really want to be sure about this kind of, uh, whether this is actually happening and whether um, we are, uh, whether we can benefit from, from changing our algorithms to, to exploit the cache hierarchy, uh, we can use quite interesting tools like uh, Intel VTune, Liquid, and Perfstat, and as well as of recently, Intel PCM, which is, um, which is something you can, uh, coming from Intel, you can compile it on your Mac uh, you need to uh, disable the kernel protection of uh, of Mac OS or uh, or whatever, but uh, but you can get it running. And it these tools are great because they give you stats around your cache hits and misses and the ratios. Apart from other really really interesting data, just getting directly read from the uh, hard the for for the model processor hardware counters on your CPU. And Intel Open PCM run on a Mac looks a bit like this, so it gives you the L2 misses and hits and uh, the ratios, uh, as well as a lot of other stuff that, that, you can, that you can look at. And for example, you can see here that for this uh, program that I run, I don't even actually remember what particular program I run here, but uh, I can see here that on the core four, I'm uh, incurring significant amount of L2 cache misses and uh, Obviously, my L2 hit ratio is quite quite low, uh, which is sort of the thing that um, can tell you that false sharing is happening. But we're going to talk about that later. Um, so, plotting that, uh, plotting this data on uh, on a chart for this particular matrix multiplication problem, uh, uh, transposition problem, uh, looks uh, as follows. And it is, again, clear that this is probably the most uh, prominent performance killer in, this, in, this, in the naive version. It's the fact that you're incurring quite a lot of L2 cache misses. And this is a topic that is so prominent in performance that there is a whole stream of research that is focused around um, the so-called cache oblivious algorithms. 
And these algorithms, uh, it, the name is a bit deceiving. It's uh, cache oblivious because they don't really need or care to know about the underlying details of the uh, cache hierarchy. So the cache line size, the cache size itself, and the depth of the caches, none of that is needed. Um, what these algorithms actually resort upon is um, pretty much dividing and conquering the problem up to a point where it's small enough to fit in cache, and then they solve it and move to the next part. So uh, most of these algorithms are recursive in nature and um, using a divide and conquer approach. And as a matter of fact, this is actually quite uh, it's used uh, in systems that need to, uh, to be engineered for performance. I think like the ACA artery, actor F cache is using um, some sort of a oblivious, cache oblivious caching uh, data structure that, that, is, um, that is in there. So uh, MIT is quite um, famous for having a whole group of researchers that are dedicated to the design and, and analysis of cache oblivious algorithms and, and, and they output quite a lot of papers and if you look at the open courseware videos, there's great videos of explaining some of the concepts and doing demos and designing algorithms on the board that uh, actually take advantage of the cache hierarchy. Some examples are matrix multiplication, such as the Strassen algorithm and uh, Frigo's transpose for transpositions, amongst others. But um, I encourage you, if you actually are facing a problem uh, where you're experiencing quite a lot of cache, cache, cache misses and that hinders your performance, um, it's, it's really good to think and go out and look at algorithms that are already out there that uh, take advantage of the underlying cache hierarchy and um, try to apply them to your particular problem because this could uh, benefit your performance significantly. <coughs> so that's that. Um, another topic that frequently comes up in uh, high performance systems, it's um, the one about synchronization, right? And synchronization has its price. And this is actually something that you are all aware of, right? I mean, we live in a concurrent world, uh, so everybody is doing concurrency nowadays, even if they don't know uh, about it. But um, it's really important to know and think about uh, what is the actual cost of what I'm doing. So Scala and the JVM in general, as well as our hardware, uh, give us this nice toolbox of things that we can use in order to write safe and correct concurrent algorithms. You know, we have atomic primitives and we have volatiles and we have concurrent collections and some of them are sy synchronized, some of them are concurrent and how concurrent they are, nobody really knows, but uh, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's a wide gamut of tools that you can use to write your algorithms. But sometimes it's really important to step back and think about well, am I using the, the right thing? And uh, furthermore, am I using it to its best uh, capabilities? And pretty much am I using the right tool for the right job here? Uh, because this matters. And as a matter of fact, matters a lot. So let's move into another example. Uh, that's kind of a toy example. So it's kind of a day in the life. I recently um, have been working with quite a lot of events. So the only thing I see is events everywhere. Um, so naturally, that's kind of my example. Let's imagine we have an event lock. Um, so it has a writer and, um, which appends events in a linear fashion to the lock, and we have a transformer that sort of tails the lock and uh, transforms these events in place. So probably really bad for um, event source systems, but yeah. Um, of course, transformer is never ahead of the writer, that, that is the constraint, you, you can't really be. So an interface uh, for that kind of uh, stateful event lock uh, looks like this, right? We have the write next and the transform next, which will pretty much take a, um, take a function and apply it to the event. And if, we, if our events are represented as ints, we can represent the state of this event lock in that fashion. We have the writer position and um, the reader, uh, the, the transformer position, and we store our events in a lock. So if we have to make sure that this is actually running 
concurrently correctly um, because we have two separate threads, one writing and one, one transforming. Um, we can go for and reach for the, 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 the first thing that, that, that some might very well think of. It's just synchronize it, you know, just synchronize these both two methods. So like the write next method, it's going to be a synchronized method. It's going to take, um, it's going to check for the constraints uh, and then it's just going to write into the position, incrementing the position as it goes. And the transform next method is similar, checks whether we are not kind of running ahead and uh, applies the function to the event and writes it back into place. So what can we do with such a thing? With an event log events, well, we can go and delete all of our events, just nulling them out. And you might think this is uh, not a good idea, but guess what? GDRP comes around soon, so probably, <laughs> probably some, of, some of us will have to do that, uh, even if they don't want to. So, um, but how does that look in terms of well, I, I hope nobody does that. We, there are better ways uh, to, to do that. Um, so how, how does that actually look in terms of performance? Oh, wow, that even moves. Uh, it's, uh, if we, if we, so I went and uh, measured that. I did uh, half a billion events sort of piped through, the, the, through this whole event log. And um, this is sort of the results we get, right? We have... Uh, north of 13 million ops per second. And uh, we have significant amount of fail to cache misses and only uh, 0.3 instructions per cycle. So why might that be happening? Well, plenty of reasons, but uh, synchronization costs quite a lot, right? And as a matter of fact, there it also introduces quite a lot of contention, not on our data, but on the lock itself. So. Transformer and, 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 and writer are contending on this, on this lock all the time, thereby introducing quite a lot of fail to cache misses. Um, can we do that in a better way? Uh, yeah, first of all, we don't really need exclusive access here, right? We have threads writing to independent variables, so only thing we need is visibility, right? We need to ensure visibility across, across threads. And so therefore, naturally, we can resort to, vo uh, resort to volatile which, uh, as you all know, it introduces, uh, happens before relationship on the JVM, full fence, and um, it ensures that the values that have been modified before are written to the L1 cache. Um, contrary to what a lot of interviewers might think, <laughs> it doesn't really force the value to be read from main memory. It, that's not what it does. It just makes sure that uh, the, the, the value is uh, visible in the L1 cache, and from then on, the hardware protocols ensure that this is visible across our cache hierarchy and to other cores as well. And um, so using that, um, we can achieve the following results. We can um, see that we've significantly decreased our L2 cache misses, and we have um, we have increased our uh, operations per second, and we have, as a matter of fact, increased our instructions per cycle as well, which is uh, a really good measure of the use of the amount of useful work we are doing. Why is that? Because uh, now we are, our CPUs will be busy retiring instructions instead of spending time waiting on um, waiting on any kind of arbit arbitration to happen and waiting on uh, fetching data from L3 cache and, and whatnot. So this, this will, of course, uh, mean that uh, it's a good measure to see that you are actually uh, using your time on the CPU a lot better. So the higher you are, pretty much the, 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 the it's, it's more useful work that you're doing. So can we uh, do something else about that? particular system? Yes, turns out we, we definitely can. Um, volatile, albeit less expensive than locking, um, it's still not very cheap. So it's, as I said, on x86, I think it reduces a full memory fence, so it's, it's, it's not cheap. Um, 
what uh, can we do is we can use this little gem in Atomics called Lazy Set, which is, um, which is as a matter of fact, quite, uh, it has spawned quite discussion on the uh, JVM mailing lists. And um, it, it's, it usually don't introduce a memory fence, but uh, the, the details around it are quite complicated. Uh, it works well in uh, particular cases, such as when you have single writers. And it's effectively a very, very cheap compared to volatile um, synchronization primitive that, that you can use in order to um, ensure and put some guarantees on visibility that in some cases are enough. And um, that being said, if we change our code, code to use that, we can see that we have significantly increased our operations per second, and we have as well increased our, the useful work that we are doing. So have brought up our instructions per cycle significantly as well. And this is just simply by using this particular piece of, um, of functionality on the, uh, from the Atomic Library. So we still have some other problems, though, that are pending in our tool that's uh, direct competition of Kafka. Uh, it's, uh, it's really the false sharing, right? We, as I mentioned earlier, L2 misses, or like the, the presence of high L number of L2 misses is um, kind of makes you think, uh, it's kind of the smell that leads you to this uh, false sharing problem. And uh, you have probably all heard about the, the, this problem, the false sharing. It's when two threads are modifying independent variables that happen to live on the same cache line. And because our, because our caches are always kept coherent, it, um, th these cache lines, um, when modified, are invalidated. So in this particular case, uh, our writer when, when it writes to the writer position variable, it will invalidate this cache line that, that, that uh, is shared with the reader position and then well, with the transformer position. When the transformer goes and reads that, the, its, its own position in order to determine, well, what to do, um, it's gonna go and fetch this data from somewhere else, but not its most uh, close to it, uh, a, a place in a, a one cache, for example, and uh, this is this is uh, this is not bad. This is good that this is there because it's uh, it uh, provides us uh, with uh, guarantees that our concurrent programs will run correctly. And what uh, what is ensured, what 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 helps that uh, guarantee is the underlying hardware protocols that are that are. Uh, implemented in our CPUs. So that's kind of one of them, uh, or a variation thereof. It's the Messy protocol. That's pretty much a finite state machine, putting every cache line into, into, into one of four states. And depending on that, um, our CPUs know whether they can uh, use what's in L1 cache, or they need to go and snoop on the bus in order to get the freshest value from some other core, or they need to resort to an access to the L3 cache, which is the costly one. And that's why I mentioned earlier that the L3 cache is sort of, um, it's sort of the fabric uh, that most often uh, is uh, ensuring the coherence of our cache system. So this is what pretty much ensures visibility, right, across threads. And um, it's, again, it's, it's, it's not cheap. So, but our particular problem in this, this case is the following, right? We are, our cache lines are usually uh, 64 bytes, right? And they are very dependent on our object layout. So going back to the volatile example, we are, we are, we are putting two variables side by side, and it's very, very likely that they will end up on the same cache line. And as I said, this means that this cache line will be invalidated once uh, either the transformer or the writer writes to it. And this is not great, because ultimately what's gonna happen is that uh, 
our data will be ping-ponging across the L3 cache, which uh, incurs significant latency instead of being kept in L1 caches and, 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 uh, and uh, resorting to this really, really quick uh, sub-nanocycle, uh, sub-nanosecond accesses uh, in, certain, in certain scenarios. So how can we actually ensure that, well, this is just, uh, it's not always the case. Pretty much it's the discretion of the compiler to do, to, do, to, do, um, uh, to, to distribute these things. <coughs> but uh, in order to, to actually get a further insight into what's, uh, what's happening is that uh, we, can, we can use uh, tool like uh, the SBT Joe from Toso. Uh, that gives us a really nice uh, way of looking at the Java object layout of our objects and kind of think and reason about these things, uh, whether we, are, uh, we might potentially introduce uh, such kind of false sharing behavior. And uh, what can we do about that? Well, back in the day, um, people would uh, go and use things like uh, explicit padding, where they would put more longs between, between the lines, uh, uh, just to pad their variables, and this is uh, and this is uh, this has been done in quite a few places, such as uh, you know in quite a few scenarios. Like so, you can pad your slots in an array or like a ring buffer, or very simply, you can pad your head and tail po pointers in a queue. But um, thankfully, nowadays uh, we have a better way to do it. We have uh, all sorts of concurrent um, libraries that can help us with padding. So, for example, that's uh, one that I, th I used. It's, um, you can create a long that's padded, right? You can create an atomic long that is padded, and um, you can pad it uh, left to right to ensure ultimate security, because uh, if you only pad between the two, between the two uh, variables, you're ensuring that they're not going to sort of ensure false sharing uh, well, cause false sharing um, to each other, but you never know where they're actually going to end up um, and what cache line will be right above them, for example. So it's important to uh, pad them both ways. Uh, it's, at least it gives you quite a lot more security around uh, avoiding false sharing. So that being said, um, let's look at what this gives us, right? So we have um, decreased our L2 misses, and um, we have increased our operations per second one, once again. And of course, we have also increased our instructions per cycle, because now we are not wasting cycles on waiting for and paying that latency to L3 caches. We're simply getting the data that's close to us, and we know that it's not, that the cache line is not invalidated. Right, so we are we are we are decreasing the latency to slower levels of the cache. We are also decreasing something that uh, can also be measured, but it's a bit more involved. It's the coherency protocol traffic. Now this is more efficient, but back in the day, I think it used to share the same uh, the same sort of fabric that that is. Uh, that is with the loads and stores uh, to, to, to the cache subsystem. So this could also increase your, uh, will decrease your performance. All of that being said, uh, it's important to look at your um, use cases and think about uh, the concurrency primitives you're using and uh, really pay attention to what they are doing, how they are doing it in the hood. And if you're not sure, measure and measure and measure in order to uh, get the best insight. So that being said, uh, let's uh, take a look at a real use case. So it's really something that's implemented currently in a live system. It's, it's in ACA, right? So how does the message lifecycle looks like? Well, we have a sender that kind of sends a message to an actor ref, and then the dispatcher is responsible for putting that onto a queue, uh, onto the, the mailbox, and this mailbox is run by the dispatcher itself, which is backed by an executor service. In most cases, that has a bunch of threats in it. So um, what are the types of the dispatchers? We have a default dispatcher um, that is sort of the default one that you kind of 
use when nothing else specified. Then we have the pinned one, and then we have a calling thread dispatcher, which is only used for tests. And then the executors that are most frequently used, uh, the fork join pool and the thread pool executor. And if we look at the thread pool executor, it would look like this, right? We have an external component submitting a runnable, in this case, the mailbox, really. Um, and then we have a bunch of threads that are picking up, um, that are picking up the work and running it. And this is a linked blocking queue. What are some of the limitations of that? Well, our hardware underneath ensures, uh, well, or at least tries to um, make, do its best in order to ensure cache affinity. So it would place threads to run on cores um, based on whether they run uh, on these cores before, or at least we'll try to. Um, that being said, one of the limitations is that this, these systems completely, um, well, uh, don't take that into advantage. So there is no actor to threat affinity. So one actor being a, be, being a stateful creature, it uh, will, as a matter of fact, not run on the same threat that it used to, most likely, because of the sort of producer-consumer nature of, of these, of these um, underlying threat pools that are ticking the actor system. So this can potentially cause quite a lot of CPU cache invalidation. And also, there is no, there is no actual way to control the, the details of how this uh, actor to threat mapping is happening. So uh, an alternative proposal that recently, got, well, not so recently, but yeah, got into the um, ACA is the affinity pool, which uh, uses a component called the queue selector that based on the actor, it will, the actor, it's mailbox, it will actually uh, go and pick one of the queues that is associated with each thread and submit it to it. So. That uh, gives you quite a bit of things. It, uh, well, it gives you the affinity and the stickiness of an actor to a particular threat. It also gives you the fact that uh, you're, you know, compared to a threat pool executor, for example, you're using uh, strip, uh, stripped um, walk-free queues in order to distribute the work. So you're decreasing contention on that uh, uh, work hand handing off fabric quite a bit. Um, Currently, the default queue selector that's implemented is the fair distribution queue selector, which uh, has an adaptive work assignment strategy, which means that if you have few actors, it's going to do sort of explicit mapping that is fair. So it's going to maintain state of like which actor matches to which threat. And if you have more actors, it's going to do consistent hashing, relying on the statistical uh, distribution of the well, statistical fairness of the hash in order to, uh, to um, kind of do that. Uh, so what are the advantages? Less cache hits due to temporal locality, decreased contention, and of course, customizable queue selection. And a benchmark that was recently in, um, uh, that is in ACA that you can run on this gives you the following results. So for a certain number of throughputs, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually um, show you that in certain scenarios, the affinity pool is increasing performance a little bit just because of the temporal locality of data. So just to summarize all of that, if you're on a hot path, really make sure you are and measure. Uh, measure everything. Use SBT GMH, Java object layout, perf stats, and watch out for features of the language that uh, increase object instantiation, such as pattern matching. Use algorithms and data structures that are cache friendly and just use efficient concurrency tools, but try not to roll your own because it's, uh, it's risky. So there are tools like GC2, Saka, Vertex that can help you with all that stuff. And these are the resources where you can read a lot more about all that stuff and the slides and code will be uploaded soon as well on my GitHub account. Well, thanks everyone for the attention. Thank you. So I don't know whether there is time for any questions or? I think we have time for one or two questions. Sure.
Ah, one question there in the front. Yeah, uh, yeah, the microphone. Yeah, sorry. Hello. You mentioned earlier that uh, some interviewers are like sure about some some misconception about caching and uh, the way the volatile work. Can you elaborate on this a little bit more? Sorry, I didn't hear very well. <laughs> Sorry. So the question was about um, earlier um, in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned something about interviewers that uh, like know how the volatile work, but uh, actually they don't. Can you like add some details here? Yeah. Well, yeah. That actually was a joke. But like I remember when I was interviewing for Java roles, like back in the day when I was still still in school. Um, they would like the run of the mill question would be like, oh yeah, so what's volatile? Can you explain what volatile is? And um, and I have heard these uh, explanations for them when I couldn't answer because there were times like that as well. Um, that well, you know, it ensures that you have thread visibility and uh, by fetching stuff from main memory. And that's what I s was referring to. That you know, it's it's to me that's not that's. It's not the whole truth, right? It's, it's not ensuring that it fetches data from main memory. Is it? Yeah. Ah, okay, so I understand that uh, okay. you just mentioned that. Uh, yeah, it's just a story. It's just an anecdote, yeah. okay. right? Sorry. Uh, but, uh, well, I'm not saying all of them are like that. It's, uh, it's uh, see, I work with Matthias. He didn't ask me that question. He, he so, but yeah, are there? Okay, we got one more question here in the front. Yeah, hi, if the tools you mentioned, do they also help me to see how my objects lay out in memory so I can maybe transform them to be more efficient? Uh, object layout in memory? Yeah. Um, I think like if you use uh, any kind of more sophisticated tools like Intel VTune and that kind of stuff, you can you can look at that, yeah. But uh, usually these things have kind of high learning curve and are commercial solutions for the most part. So, it's, yeah. but yeah, they are, they are tools. Yeah, JOL is great. As I said, this is this you can reason quite a lot about the stuff that you see there. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really my go-to tool to sort of get a real kind of understanding of what's happening. Okay, so, so, yeah. so since drinks and uh, food is waiting outside, cool. I suggest that there are all other questions just come to the stage. Thank you.